Welcome to this panel discussion. I am Rakesh Vintachalam. I have uh, over 25 years in the IT industry. I'm moderating this discussion. So this is regarding the recent book of uh, the famous author Rajiv Malhotraji, AI and the Future of Power. Without much ado, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, Siddharth Shankar, Karthikeyan Shankaran, a director in a large uh, analytics company. Hari Krishnan Nair, uh, an IT entrepreneur. I'd like to, uh, you know, get the view from Rajiv Malhotra Ji. Sir, what do you think of the future for India in the year 2030? What is your vision for India with respect to the AI context? So uh, uh, I would have uh, uh, put that, uh, let, we, we can start with that, although that ought to be a conclusion of many things. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, my conclusion of where things are heading for India is not very optimistic. And I say it as a friend of India. I've spent most of my adult life uh, sacrificing and working for the cause of India uh, in, in all sorts of ways I can, possibly can, last 25, six, 26 years full time. So it's very saddening for me to uh, make, do this. But my book is, my thesis is a contrarian thesis to this, uh, you know, superpower India and wish for Guru India and all of that, because I see some headwinds. Uh, I think that the Indian brain is very brilliant and can solve such problems, has solved such problems, but only after acknowledging them, after understanding what the problems are, can we solve them. So I, I, I'm pointing out in this book, a number of uh, challenges that India faces and that, that AI is either creating or it's making worse. The challenges might have existed already and India is making worse. I mean, AI is making worse. The, by 2030, uh, it, probably even sooner, uh, the, the, uh, the, the effect of AI will be undeniable. Right now, people are talking about uh, climate change. It should be talked about. They're talking about genetic uh, modification of GM foods. They're talking about water shortages, terrorism. They're talking about certain problems that public need to know about. But they're not talking about AI. And, and what I'm trying to do is bring AI into the mass consciousness of people because it affects society. Like nuclear policy affects society, the space research affects society. It's not only for space scientists, but it has social impact. Uh, now, similarly, AI has good impact and a problematic impact. And so society representations need to understand more about it. That's my view that by 2030, I would say, in fact, by 2025, AI will become one of the most important talked about subjects in panels, in monthans, in literary festivals. Uh, right now, you feel uh, right now in India, unlike in the United States where it is a topic, but in India, the general public and the leaders, the politicians, the, uh, the media people, they're not informed. And so only conversation happening on AI is, you know, specialists like you. Uh, and, and my job is to bridge this gap between the people in, in the specialized world of AI and the general public who are going to be affected. The impact of AI will be positive and negative. Uh, and the, the negative impacts are going to be serious also. Uh, positive impacts are going to be serious also. And I'm not sure the thought leaders of India are fully prepared. What makes a panel interesting is you stick to what, what are the provocative statements I'm making and hit me hard and ask me questions and I will answer those. So let me ask you a question specifically yeah. with regarding to jobs because that is a topic which is close to very you know, every Indians. Right. So in, in, in India, it is a general feeling that you know with the advent of information technology, we have been able to increase our uh, middle class. You know, the substantial number of engineering colleges that came up and phenomenal amount of uh, IT industry and the startups came which, which generated jobs and growth. So similarly, you know, just extrapolating the same kind of growth for AI in our context, in the Indian context, won't it add uh, to the uh, general uh, uh, technology growth and the number of jobs in the country? I don't know what makes you feel that it will be uh, detrimental to growth uh, for a country like India. Okay, so uh, my position on this is contrarian to the, uh, the wisdom uh, the, the research that is being done by PwC and Fiki and Ernst and Young, I've read all that. It is very top-down, corporate-oriented thinking, and they have not gone to the villages, to the districts, to see how it will impact the average person. I'm concerned about the job impact, about the AI impact on the bottom 500 million people, the migrant workers, the, the people who are not going to become AI trained, the people who are not going to take courses on machine learning. 
So the impact, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, you know, driverless cars and electric cars, uh, you know, of course, AI plays a role in making the, all that possible, the driverless cars and, AI and electric cars. Uh, will not be uh, using the same internal combustion engine manufactured in India. Uh, it'll be a new kind of an engine. And, and the job, the, there are 5 million or four, 4 or 5 million workers in India in the auto sector, uh, not only making cars, but making ancillaries and exporting them. Now, you don't need an electric car. You don't need a carburetor. You don't need a spark plug. You don't need all those hundreds of parts. So the entire ancillary, auto ancillary business will go out of business. A few million people will lose jobs. Now, will a few million new car, uh, jobs be created uh, when uh, a few it, big companies will take over this uh, electric car uh, and driverless car business, and they don't need so many parts. They don't need so many parts. So what happens to all the parts manufacturers? They are small and medium-sized manufacturers. What happens to them? Has somebody thought through? Uh, just logic that in the past it happened, uh, the new technology did something, therefore by extrapolation is not strong enough. I mean, you expect thought leaders to be more thorough than that. You have to look at industry by industry. So there has to be an automobile industry impact analysis saying, that these, these spare parts or these, these ancillaries are not needed, how many million jobs are lost? And then you calculate if we replace the old car technology with the new car technology, what kind of jobs will be required? And I don't think so. You will need, a you will need only a fraction of that many jobs. And the, the lithium battery is imported from China. Now in India, they're going to start manufacturing it under license from China. The, the active in, ingredient, the lithium itself is not in India, it is in, in China. And the technology is in China. So we are going to take a internal combustion engine automobile, which is entirely indigenized. There's no imported requirement. And we're going to kill that industry and replace it with a new industry uh, where a large, large part is imported and the total number of employees needed is less. So I would like to do this industry by industry, bottom up, district by district. The, the, maybe the job will be created in Bangalore, where there will be some AI type people doing uh, driverless cars. Agreed. But the, but the drivers in Bihar, Odisha, all over India, uh, we lose their jobs. So what you have to do is not a very high level, superficial. I, I, the reason I spent years writing books is to is because I, I didn't want to. Uh, if it were just superficial, just regurgitating, recycling with nothing new, then I would not get out of retirement and bother so much to write a book. I'm writing a book because I challenge all that. I, chat, I, I defy you to show me one single AI report, AI impact report, anywhere in India, which is done bottom up. And you have to do industry by industry, bottom up. The reports that they have done, I don't know if you've read those, they go and they, they survey the HR department. Uh, what is your thought on AI? And then they say, oh, 35% of the people said thought on AI is very good. So it must be good. That's not, that's not a real business plan with actual hard data. So, I, that, so I, I, I don't buy the forecast. I, I haven't seen a good forecast, which would be state-specific and industry-specific. The outcome for Odisha will be different. For Bihar, it will be different. For Karnataka, it will be different. The, and for one industry, it will be a certain way. Another industry will be a certain way. You know, we used to have a, a record label industry uh, in, the, in, in the U.S., also in India. RCA Records, Columbia Records, Sony Records, they were the big record companies. And uh, every shop, every uh, uh, market had a record store. Uh, you could, there was a Sam Goodies, uh, tens of thousands of uh, record stores in all over the US. They're gone because of iTunes and other downloading. So of course, the iTunes and other downloading services, streaming services created an industry. A lot of people got jobs, but then the whole old record label business vanished. I, I, have, a, I have a small tape, sir. So, you know, uh, to and, uh, imagine that everybody in the lower most strata of society will be an AI user is, you know, slightly out of order, but he will be a beneficiary. Uh, that is, you know, not incorrect. So I, I still remember the days when we used to stand in queues to book a uh, train ticket and, and it used to be a, a clerical exercise. And then when computers came, you know, people said that, you know, sizable number of uh, these reservation clerks will be rendered jobless. But that didn't happen. That that didn't happen. So so whenever there is any technology uh, advent that takes place, it it technology by its nature itself is disruptive. It tends to you know change the existing order. But then society as a whole 
finally uh, reinvents itself and and it eventually every growth or every positive step is inclusive the only difference is in, in certain cases it is you know a bottom up and in from some cases it will percolate from the top to the bottom so you know if if we were to go by the uh, same logic that that's what i, I always say that uh, you know we would still be uh, running in bullock carts and tangas because when taxis came and buses came sizable number of these people also lost jobs and you know one bus could carry 100 people which effectively meant that uh, probably you know 50 or 20 tanga uh, walas uh, lost their source of livelihood i i i think you're mixed up uh, you're mixing producers and consumers uh, the impact on consumers is very good uh, even if there is a 100% automation which can't happen and robots and ai running the whole world uh, as consumers we will be better off uh, i will get many things on time if there were no pilots and airplane flying on their own, maybe they'll be more accurate. So evaluating life as consumers is what you are doing uh, when you are giving your examples. Uh, okay. Uh, but it, the job, it, the question before this panel is jobs, which is about producers, not whether the consumer life will be better. Your, your examples are from consumers, but you are not answering that. You're not addressing the point here. Uh, I have certain data from a very, very esteemed consulting company on this topic. So can I present it now or later? No, no, present it now, but tell us the, comp- the, the, the who. McKinsey, McKinsey, McKinsey Global Institute. I've seen the McKinsey report. Yes. I, I have, in fact, quoted it in my book, the McKinsey report. This is uh, basically showing the economic agenda for India f- with respect to jobs and growth. This is at the topic of our discussion today, right? Right, right. So uh, I have just, see, this is pertaining to multiple sectors. These arrows are pertaining to the digital uh, economic value added, right. economic value added with respect to digital, which right. could be AI, which is essentially AI. And uh, you could say around 60% of it is AI. Okay. So uh, if you see here, you know, uh, this, for example, digital services, there are three broad seg- uh, segments and all this adds up to around uh, 950 billion. Yeah, yeah I, I'm familiar with this. Yes. Right. Yes. So this is the economic value added, and if you take around, this is this is around you know uh, overall it is 2.5 trillion, the val- economic value added by 2030, and this comes to 950, which is, you know, uh, uh, some somewhere around 25 to 30 percent of the you know if you, if you take uh, just AI alone, it, that's okay. the number we are looking at. So okay. this is just one this is just one part of it. The the next one is showing the number of jobs. Number of jobs, uh, uh, we are talking about number of jobs from knowledge economy. This is around 89 million. Now, this includes multiple sectors, but it, it would be around 70 million if you take, you know, uh, only the AI, uh, IT sector, right? Around 70 million, I would say. So, have you, looked at, have you looked at their report, uh, the methodology they used? Yeah, I haven't gone very detailed, but the, what, you're, you what you're referring to is the ideal way to do it. But I think they have done a top-down, you know, not a bottom-up approach. They yeah. have done a top-down. So let me tell you what they did. They did a survey of the largest corporations in the world, and India was one of the countries. And I have their worldwide report also. So they went to the big corporate. This is in alliance with World Economic Forum, which is a corporate, corporate, uh, the biggest corporates, the biggest enterprises, the biggest multinationals. It is their view. Uh, these guys, McKinsey's and PwC and W uh, World Economic Forum, work for Corporate Inc. They don't work for the Aam Aadmi. And the corporate people employ less than ten percent of India's workforce. You should know that the total number of the total number of people who are working for you know the big corporate who get their payroll from the big corporate sector is less than 10% the other 90% are small sector the medium uh, small and medium sector they are self employed they are street vendors they are tr- truck drivers so 90% of india's employees are not included in this survey it is a survey of corporate people and they can deem up anything they want there are several flaws in this that i pointed out uh, in my analysis. In fact, there's a better analysis than this by the gentleman who is a Tata's, uh, he's the chairman of Tata. And he just wrote a book called Bridge Digital. I, have, I don't know if you've read it, B-R-I-D-G-I-D-A-L. It's a Bridge Digital, uh, hyphen of the two words. And he's co-authored it with a, uh, with a younger uh, a, co- a, a woman who's uh, his uh, co-author there, and she's a specialist in this. They are acknowledging the problem more seriously and more openly than McKinsey has. 
and they are proposing a very innovative solution, which I think is pretty interesting. But as far as the McKinsey's of the world are concerned, it is meant to impress people like you. It is doing its job, but the, it is only a corporate view. And it is a view that because the corporate people do not want too much interference with from people like me and people like uh, rights groups and uh, NGOs and uh, uh, you know, people representing the labor force, because th what they want to do is top down and the disruption it creates, they're assuming two things. First, they're assuming a lot of people will get retrained. But then in another report, McKinsey, it was either McKinsey or World Economic Forum. They went and asked these people, the cost of retraining, have you included it in your annual budget? And they said no. So there is this wish that people will be retrained, but who's going to retrain them and at what cost has not been addressed. The, in fact, one of the points you mentioned in your, uh, I mean, which I, which I did notice in, in, in your book, I think is, you know, are there any structural problems to fix? You, you know, the structural problems are there to fix. I mean, these are the, some of the winning win capabilities of firms, right? Is talking about digital supply chain and all these things. We have to ride this wave. When there is a wave going on in the world, I think the point what uh, Siddharth was trying to make, there is a wave going on in the world and we need to ride it. So yes. so that's, that's this is win capabilities. There are multiple other things here on top, but the one that's highlighted in green is talking about actually riding the verb, embracing it and, you know, getting, getting on to the thing. And in terms of the structural issues, these are the structural issues. We don't have very large companies in, in uh, China and the, and the like, it's 1.6 times higher. And in our competing, uh, you know, countries, the, the, the mid-sized companies are 1.9 times higher. Smaller is okay. We are somewhere there. And micro, yes, we are, we are, you know, pretty much comparable. But here is the problem. Mid and large size companies, we, we have, a, we don't have that number of, we need more small companies to come to big, bigger company size. This is probably one of the tougher discussions I probably would have had for quite a while because I do participate in a lot of uh, panel discussions and educate people on AI. But then the focus there is talk about, as Rajiv Ji said, about the good things about AI, right? What are some of the use cases in different industries? How can companies implement these use cases and gain a lot of competitive advantage and things like that? That by itself is a topic which is fairly complex. Mm -hmm. But when you bring in the dimension of society and how do you really look at the impact on society, I think the complexity increases manifold, right? So it's, uh, it's very, very important to start thinking from multiple perspectives. And I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, discussion, but obviously fairly complex, right? So I will have certain pointers. And I mean, when I think of my mission in this world, I would say, you know what, I want to simplify the whole narrative. I think there's just too much of complexity out there in the world. So I will approach this from that perspective of trying to give some pointers to figure out how we can navigate through this space, okay? So, and whatever I've heard so far, one of the things I clearly heard was about uh, jobs and kind of disruption, right? And I will kind of label this as, because this is, the, this is the thing that has been spoken about quite a bit, is about creative destruction, right? And creative destruction has been happening in the course of humanity for a fairly long period of time, right? The only difference I would say in the AI world is that the pace at which this creative destruction is happening is just probably 10, 100, 1000 times higher than what happened during the industrial revolution and probably what happened historically speaking, right? So that's, that's one vantage point. I think we should start off with saying that change is inevitable, right? Creative destruction is going to happen. Companies have to morph. There is a very famous study which spoke about the top 100 companies in the world around 1900s. And out of that 87 companies folded up when, when it came to 1980s and 1990s, right? And there are only a few companies that kind of stood up. And now you see some of those digital native companies ruling a lot, but that's going to change inevitably again, as things change, as things morph, et cetera, how it will change, what kind of dynamics will play out is something that we'll have to uh, look at. And of course, that is one of the purpose of this discussion. The second point I want to quickly touch upon is, we we tend to get confused, I, at least I, I I used to get confused about creation of wealth and distribution of wealth, especially in an Indian context for a long time, we were talking about income disparity, right? But I think the more important thing was how do we create wealth at all, right? Before you start thinking about how do you distribute it, right? And I think India has turned a corner in some sense where I think there are a lot of avenues by which people can create wealth. And India is definitely becoming more wealthier 
as compared to even 10, 15, 20 years. And that, uh, that shift, I think, is irreversible, right? But having said that, creation of wealth is only one part of the story, right? For the society to function well, and there is no dysfunction in society, we need to seriously think about how do you distribute the wealth, right? And I think India has still a long way to go in terms of thinking through this. And, and when you bring in the AI context, I think AI is another tool by which you can, you can increase the wealth manifold, right? Of big corporations, societies, lot more consumer type of things kind of coming in. It's only going to uh, what is called as a velocity of money, right? It's going to increase. So the creation of wealth will, will happen. But I think where this book is very important and this discourse and the contrarian view is very important is the fact that oh, are we seriously thinking about how are we distributing that wealth, right? So that all parts of the society grow and it's not kind of uh, uh, skewed in one way or the other, right? I think for a change, we are having a very honest and candid conversation, right? Uh, rather than, you know, there's no sugar coating here, uh, right? We are trying to see reality as, as we see it today. Right and preparing for the future. I think that's 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 the context of this, and, and that's where and that's how I'll also try and provide my perspectives. Uh, and before I do, I, I just want to uh, you know I just want to comment on where am I coming from. Um, see, I've been an entrepreneur now for about uh, close to fourteen years, and uh, the last ten years have been in the education industry. Right. So so all of my experience, all of my thoughts and perspectives are from a position where I've had the fortune of working, you know, at a, at a confluence of industry and jobs, right? Because as, you know, as an entrepreneur, my, uh, you know, I serve two responsibilities. One is to help people become more employable, right? By giving them good quality education. And on the other hand is working closely with corporates uh, to ensure that, you know, what we are trying to uh, upskill uh, professionals or learners in is relevant for them, right? So all my thoughts and perspectives are from there. And, and, you know, the discussions that I've had in that context. So the fact that AI will disrupt the world and, and uh, you know, it will have, uh, it, it is just going to kind of percolate even more and more is inevitable, right? Now, uh, it, it's already happening at a pace much larger, uh, much, much faster than many of us realize. In fact, I, you know, as consumers itself, many times we don't realize how many times is AI being used, right? In, in many of the apps, businesses that we patronize, but it is, we don't realize it, right? It is already there, right? And, and that's just going to happen. That's, that's an irreversible change. Um, as, a, as a country, uh, you know, our options are that do we capitalize on it or, you know, do, do we go at our own pace and, and see where kind of, you know, what destiny of ways uh, awaits us. And I think that is where this discussion is extremely important. Why I've coined this, I think world across experts now recognize that AI is, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. Right. And when we say something is of that proportion, it obviously means that, you know, it is going to change society. It is going to change the very fabric of society. It is not about, you know, the, the blue collared workers. Right. It is not about the Fortune 100 companies. It is about society at large and that this change is going to happen across the board. Right. And how do we prepare for that? Um, so given that that is the magnitude of change that is going to happen, uh, I see this as a massive opportunity for our generation and for our country, right? I see that this is an opportunity that we have been presented or, or we are at the cusp of this opportunity where we have the opportunity to, to leapfrog, right? And, you know, rather than going at the cycles at which we are, right, we can use this opportunity to leapfrog development in our country. But having said that, that still is a very, you know, top-down view, right? Uh, I think the key thing here is to address or to acknowledge the challenges. And, you know, one of the things, and just like, just like Mr. Karthikin was earlier mentioning, you know, there are umpty number of panels, umpty number of discussions where the entire discussion is about, you know, jobs and, uh, you know, uh, economic value and so on, right, that this opportunity presents. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm taking a view as an educator, right? And, and my view is this, right, that no doubt there's an opportunity, but, you know, we will do massive injustice to this opportunity, if we look at it only from the views or, or only from the lens of what the future holds for, uh, you know, our professional sector, right? Or our, let's say our, you know, um, our skilled professionals, folks who are already working in big corporates and are already in technology and so on, because there's another world out there, right? It's not as if this technology and this change has to completely disrupt their lives, right? And, you know, I, I'll, I'll present an example. Uh, you know, when, 
when the first industrial revolution came about with you know with uh, with massive improvements in manufacturing and assembly lines right a lot of jobs were disrupted right and and we see that even now right when when tata goes and sets up a factory in, in the remotest corners of india right you know a, a lot of existing professions there get disrupted right and people actually do you know uh, do start working for the manufacturing facility right so this is a change that we have seen right and this is a change that has happened over and over again now the way that we can actually completely capitalize this capitalize this opportunity is if we think of you know what we have to do across the board right it is not just about upskilling just in ai and digital technologies for professionals but it is also about our current our current blue collared workers our current uh, you know members of the society who are working in small and medium sectors what kind of vocational skills do they need what does the future mean what does the future mean for somebody who is working in a pharma industry what does the future mean for somebody who is working uh, you know as a uh, as a foreman in an automobile industry what are the new jobs what are the vocational skills that they can be provided and preparing them for that and of course there are there are moot questions of who's going to invest who's going to train right those still have to be answered but i think that is the plan we need to draw out. but that is still addressing people who are already in the workforce if we really have to capitalize on this opportunity i believe the key and and one of the most important aspects is look at the education that's happening in the for the kids uh, you know in schools and colleges right because this is not going to stop at 2030 right uh, you know if we have to grow this way it is equally important to go back to the grassroots and see how are we building up that the next generation of indians who can come and capitalize and grow on this wave and take take the country ahead okay, i'm very really happy that uh, these comments are coming up because this is exactly what i wanted uh, is a good honest uh, hari said it right uh, we have to get honest uh, so uh, first of all i am for technology i'm a technocrat myself i'm a physicist and a computer scientist and 50 years ago was, my uh, graduate studies in computer science were actually in ai but in those days mm-hmm. we write uh, you know uh, a chess program a chess stuff you know so i am a technocrat i i did my my success was as a, as a tech guy uh, so i'm not anti technology by any means uh, uh, but my quest my uh, quest is to figure out whether the current policies and the current trajectory india is on is going to succeed that doesn't mean we stop the technology it's not like we go to bullet cards but do we need better policies how we do it okay so i think hari is on to the, something interesting now both kartik and hari talked about industrial revolution so let me let me say this the industrial revolution of britain and today's ai re- revolution i have a table comparing the two in my book in one of the chapters mm-hmm. uh, the speed of the industrial revolution was slow compared to this so mm-hmm. when farms got mechanized and factories got created because there was not so much speed of capital venture capital and investment capital today is so much that you scale very quickly if somebody does a prototype and it makes money then it will be scaled 1000 fold like if uber is successful then they'll go to every city right away like that but in those days the mechanization of farms happened over 50 years from the time it started the mechanization of farms happened over 50 years so if i'm a 35 year old farmer i don't lose my farming job right away because i can continue working as with the old technology farm uh, uh, until i retire and my son will go to the factory it is an intergenerational generation n continues living in the old way and generation n plus 1 goes to the new way uh, whereas in the case of ai it is so sudden because the scale is so quick the availability of capital is so quick the world is so interconnected something is successful in one place it immediately get my um, goes viral everybody wants to do it so what happens is if i'm a 35 year old worker and my the technology makes my job obsolete it is not that these guys will keep me around till i retire and my son will go into the new technology i'll be out of work i'll be out of work if i have a retail shop and the the online wallas take over uh, it's not like i'll keep running until i retire my son will go into a cash register or go and work on amazon for a warehouse somewhere it's not like that so one is the sudden suddenness of technology change this is new and you cannot apply the old logic and too many people are applying the old logic of industrial revolution mein ye hua tha phir hoga second thing you know i was in this race 2020 uh, on ai government panel you know and in my panel the first speaker was a guy from britain and he used the same argument that in britain he was, he gave a picture of some job some guy doing a job and he says the industrial revolution came this job was eliminated and then he shows that worker sitting in a factory 
And he says, but this new job is created. Now, he didn't stay for me, my turn to object to it and give a rebuttal. He didn't stay, he went. Uh, he left the panel. But my point was, in the Industrial Revolution, killed the jobs in India and created the jobs in England. So it's a disruption. Industrial Revolution is the cause of colonial system. There would be no colonial system as we know it without the Industrial Revolution. So Industrial Revolution, yes, it created jobs and it destroyed jobs, but not equally. It created jobs in one place, it destroyed jobs in another place. So you have to keep that in mind also. So that's a second difference between the, uh, I mean, that is a fact that this Industrial Revolution will also have. You may be creating a huge amount of colonial imperialistic power with the United States and China competing for colonies. You may create that. Uh, just like France and England were, were industrial powers, compete, they both became highly industrialized, and now they're competing for colonies and fighting wars. They were fighting wars in India also, the French troops and British troops were fighting wars. So similarly, you may have control over colonies. So China will take over Pakistan, much of Africa, some parts of Latin America, USA will have its own colonies. And so, you know, the disruption has a geopolitical ramification. Just because on a macro level, uh, more jobs are created than destroyed doesn't mean that in my village in Bihar, that's going to be the case. Okay, so uh, that's my second point. So uh, regarding the, in, re using the industrial revolution as, a, as an analog, and I'm very glad that you raised this uh, issue of, of uh, industrial revolution. My third point is, if there weren't, I mean, if you do a thought experiment, and technical people do thought experiments, when you simulate, you're doing a thought experiment. So if you simulate a model of India, where the bottom 500 million are not there. Do that. I, I did that kind of exercise. You imagine that India is only half the population and it's the upper half in terms of education, economic strata, development index and all that, and the lower half is not there. Then a lot of the logic you guys are giving is absolutely perfect. It would be, it would be easy to upscale these people. It would be easy to educate them. Uh, they, they will get corporatized very quickly and India will move forward because of AI. But the fact is, you cannot wish those 500 million bottom people away. You cannot wish that they are not there. They are there. So now the question that Hari touched on is, what are you going to do about those people? I mean, this is all thinking of, I came from very elite school and all that, you know. I, I, for me, it's, life is great. I, I, I'm not going to be affected by any adverse things. Yeah, it's great for me. Only positive things. I'm worrying about the bottom 500 million people, not a trivial number. They'll become more of a liability. It will be more like, how do we get them jobs? How do we do we give them free khana and, food and housing and gas and uh, medical just because we need to look after them, which we should? Or are they also going to be productive members in a world, world with 12 billion people? Now there's 8 billion. There'll be 12 billion people okay, by the later part of the century. That's the prediction. So out of 12 billion people all competing, all this kind of stuff, what will the bottom half of India... What, how will they make their living? You have to really come up with a strategy. If you, cannot work, if you cannot solve the worst case of a problem, the worst case, when you're designing a bridge, you don't, uh, you don't solve it for some lightweight people walking. You, tr you take the worst case heavy trucks that will be going and see if it can handle it. You always have the worst case load to simulate a model. So I'm, ask, I'm challenging whether the Indian people, the Indian thinkers uh, have done a worse, have looked at the plight of the worst case bottom half of the pyramid, to be able to say that this is going to be good for India. Because it, I fully agree with you, if the bottom half hypothetically did not even exist, it would be fantastic. I would not write this book. I would write a different kind of book. But I think that people who are into the AI scene and looking at what the ramifications are have ignored the bottom half of the pyramid. That's my point. Thank you. Got it, got it. Sir. So I, I think uh, I, I fully, uh, I mean, see, the, the, the first, in, in the first uh, speech where what you mentioned was, you know, there is a lot of due diligence, if I may use that word, right? Uh, detailing, bottom-up detailing that needs to be done state by state, sector by sector, or to, to come out with this type of plan of action. Uh, but, you know, uh, my, um, one point which I just wanted to mention uh, is that this whole transformation or change, if I may call it, would it be so sudden? Wouldn't my view is that there would be enough time? For example, let, let me take the, an, an example and you know explain my point. For example, uh, this computer vision to you know getting drive, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this driverless cars, right? So by the time driverless cars actually 
uh, you know we have actual models coming and then cabs becoming uh, driverless cars drivers would have enough time to find out other occupations and uh, it would have enough time to move on to other occupations is my humble view yes that is good if, uh, for, for in the in the in that example for india it will happen slowly in the us not so slowly in the us truck drivers are losing jobs because there is already a driverless truck and amazon is uh, turning its whole fleet into uh, electric driverless very quickly and home delivery with dr drones and all that in us it will happen because the driver salary is high and you can displace it with automation and so there will be a few lakh drivers in developed economies very quickly losing their jobs in india it will take much longer and that in that particular example i think the masses of india are safe from driverless cars but there are other examples where the adoption is very sudden so so sir i have a small question you know with the advent of technology and let us take the agriculture sector over the years and from what i have heard from my father and and incidentally i come from the state of bihar the uh, do you agree or disagree that with the advent of technology there has been a, a general increase in rural prosperity over the last 20 30 years or or not That's i answer, I'll answer it. Uh, yes there has been huge benefit of technology and this technology has overall done good uh, however 50% of indians depend on agriculture 50% and only 15% 15 of the gdp is agriculture so you can see that while while we have improved the production of uh, uh, of uh, farming and all that i mean the reason these farm people are always in trouble with the farm bill without the farm bill before that previous government they always suicide all the farmers are not in happy shape in india because farming is overpopulated when you look at the bottom 50% of india and you say we we don't know how to how to sustain them without subsidies large part of them are farmers so why farming itself may have become more productive as a, as as, a, as an industry but the ability to employ such a large population of people on farms with that when the technology actually uh, things are more productive with less labor you know and ai is also disruptive in farms also by the way a lot of farming uh, automation going on uh, so my take is that india did not get the first first industrial revolution because in the first in the, in the british industrial revolution was because people were no longer needed on farms and they went from farms farms got automated they went to factories factories needed more people so this automation of farm hasn't happened in india because we cannot get rid of so many we cannot throw these people out so the problem comes back to overpopulation the problem really comes back to overpopulation if if india had see instead of 1.3 billion people with the brains that india has india could automate using ai and run the country with 200 million people i am telling you i i can give you a very convincing scenario which says we we can, can generate enough capital we could run a the whole geography have a good gdp become one of these very high tech uh, com countries where per capita income would be very high and we would need only about 200 million people what will you do with so many other people and you cannot get rid of the people quickly even if you have population control it takes 50 years if you had if you said no more uh, no more than one child the lot of people that are born already it will take them a long time before they are done they're gone from this earth and so that is not something you can qu quickly reduce a population so we are stuck with the current population for most of this century most for the till the end of this century you can hardly change the population in fact it's going to increase my concern is when you add the high population to all these other problems what's the way out i don't see a simple way out with ai so so are are you telling sir so you know even in the case of agriculture with mechanization there was a substantial reduction in dependence on farm labor and 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 what happened is that uh, this farm labor eventually moved and moved into alternate professions you know maybe a mason or a construction work because with technology uh, the farming uh, efficiency improved and, and and certain farmers uh, definitely became more prosperous and probably you know uh, there was some alternate employment that was generated even in the rural sector so so that is that's my take and as i understand from you so what you are telling is or are you implying that the problem is not with ai the problem is with the utilization of this uh, uh, 1.3 billion population 
when yes. AI comes in. Yes. No, no. I think I'm glad you reminded me. My entire mm-hmm. thesis is that if we were 200 million people, we would become a superpower for sure. We would beat China. We would probably beat United States in one generation because we got the brains and AI is the greatest opportunity to leapfrog ahead. Uh, We would be a very great power if we did not have this massive burden of human beings that we must look after. They are our people. We have to look after them. The the combination of high population, uh, 17 million people entering the job age every year that require jobs and only a fraction of that many jobs created every year is a very serious problem. So when you look at high population, unemployment, and do you know in the official unemployment figures, they do not include women. The unemployment would be so much higher if they included women. And read it. It they says that women are not included because the assumption is women choose not to work. I mean, come on. If you gave them jobs, they would probably work. So the assumption that only for men they're taking the unemployment. And even, even then, among men, some of the people who have jobs, it's artificially created jobs. It's a burden on government to create a job just to keep the people employed. This 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 represents a massive opportunity for socio-economic organizations, NGOs, companies who are into social with any corporate with a corporate conscience, with a corporate social responsibility, foundations in any foundation, right? I mean, they 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 need to wake up. One thing I I I'm, I'm kind of reminded of this quote. Uh, which basically says fear is generally worse than reality, right? And hope is much more important than fulfillment, right? So especially in Indian context, the second part of the whole thing is very important because just take the IT revolution itself, right? Which has been there for around 20, 25 years. And in some sense, I was kind of uh, uh, right in the middle of it when the whole thing kind of started in 1993, 94. That is when I got into the industry also. What it has provided is hope for a lot of engineering folks that they can actually land a a solid job after they complete their education, right? Whatever discipline that is, good or bad is a a debatable thing. People might say, you know what, oh, everybody came into computer science or software. What happens to the mechanical engineers? I, I was a metallurgical engineer, right? But the point is I'm trying to make is for the youngsters who have so much of energy and, and uh, things that they can accomplish, Channelizing the energy into something that they can contribute to the world, right? I think IT industry is unparalleled in terms of uh, kind of elevating the the, uh, the importance that one can feel, the self confidence that the Indians started feeling at that point in time. That I actually go there, I can travel to different parts of the world, and and I think uh, it was Narayana Murthy who who made that comment, right? The Indian passport got its importance, right? probably during that age when people started traveling, started getting into a lot more of these white collar jobs and things like that, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, I think there is a lot of uh, possibilities. There are a lot of things that we can do right. And going back to the education, yes, we need to do it right. But then to me, it's not the end point because we don't know. It's a very dynamic, non-linear kind of a thing that you really know what the end outcome would be. But the trajectory is very important, right? when you're actually investing and doing something, are we doing it the right way? Are we ensuring that we are generating wealth and are we ensuring that we are creating jobs in the best way possible? And going back to the earlier point I made about industrial revolution, in fact, I didn't say industrial revolution per se, I spoke about creative destruction. And to me, industrial revolution was just an example of creative destruction. That whole thing about outsourcing, offshoring is a creative destruction. It's not that systems are were not managed in other parts of the world. It's just that the business model uh, facilitated the whole thing to be managed in an offshoring kind of a country and that elevated, right, gave a lot more jobs. So as part of this creative destruction, there is always going to be comparative advantage across countries, right? India is be, probably being the IT services capital of the world because there is a comparative advantage in doing it in India, right? And with the AI revolution coming in, there is going to be comparative advantage across different countries. Who will win? Who will lose out? Right? Is something that it will play out. It is very important to focus on it. But I think it's not all lost. So, so Karthik, I fully agree with what you're saying. But I, let me give you a thought experiment. Suppose instead of 500 million people depending on farms for, for livelihood, suppose it was 100 million or 150 million. And we're using the, all this technology, they could produce as much, if not more. What do you? Th- what would you? What India version A, which is current India, as it is, and India version hypothetical version B, which is what I'm the scenario I'm saying. 
what do you think would be better and what do you think would be the comparison between the two if through magic you could push a button and that was the case it had we never got grown so much because <laughs> at the time of independence we were 400 million believe me okay so suppose you could re- rewind time and suppose you could end up in 2021 uh, with uh, a farming population of not 500 million but a small fraction what are your thoughts on that because then i'll, I'll follow up on that I mean, I definitely agree that overpopulation or a larger population introduces a lot of uh, problems that needs to get solved, right? But I don't think the question really is, can we do away with the population? Because that's, I mean, in some sense, you are are dealt this scenario, right? Yes, there are efforts to reduce the population, reduce the birth rate, etc. But this is the reality that we are living in. And that's going to be the case for the next 30, 40 years. There's no getting away from it, right? But... I think there are positives to it in terms of, I mean, being such a a country of 1.4 billion people and still having a democratic process to kind of elect the leaders. I think it's a great accomplishment for a country like India. I think it brings in a lot of diversity. It brings in a lot of resilience. It brings in different points of view. So tomorrow, let's say farming starts in Antarctica, for example, in a big way, right? I think Indians will be the first ones to actually go there and do that farming, right? You're assuming that uh, that that we'll be allowed to do that. I mean, they're, 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 that's a whole, but that's a political issue. It's not something up to us. We there, there are also there is a likelihood with global warming, large parts of Siberia will become the most fertile place in the world. But the Russians are not going to import 200, 300 million Indians. They're going to bring robots. Russia may become a very wealthy country because it'll have a large amount of fertile land and water and very low population, and they'll, with a huge amount of automation, they may actually become a superpower 50 years from now. But continue, please. So I recently read this book called AI Superpowers by uh, uh, by this author. Chinese guy. Chinese, Chinese guy. Right? Chinese guy. Chinese guy, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know him. I know him. Okay. He so to, I found it. Yeah, he, used to be, he used to work for Google and Microsoft at one time. Correct. He used to work for Microsoft at one time, right? But his personal story is also, I mean, he got diagnosed with cancer and then he was in remission and things like that. So the bottom line, the point I wanted to make was there are still going to be a lot of jobs where compassion and empathy are required and that's a truly unique human skill. Yes. So I think we need to identify areas where it's a combination of technology and human empathy, love, compassion, which probably creates more jobs than what probably is, is going to get replaced by with the mechanization and all the repetitive task itself, right? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's in some sense, as I said, the hope, right, is that you can still uh, uh, kind of get that kind of a trajectory going. Uh, so there are three uh, broad points that I'd like to make. <clears throat> uh, I think point number one is that uh, right now, you know, we are looking at AI as something that is just going to come and replace an existing let's say, set of jobs or set of industries and so on, right? But in a country like ours, I think we should also acknowledge that we operate in a market or an industry of very inefficient systems. It is manufacturing, whether it is supply chain, whether it is healthcare, right? There are so many of these inefficient voids, right, that we are operating in as a country, as a society, right? And AI presents an opportunity for us to solve many of those right? Which is also extra jobs, which is also jobs being created. Those jobs are not there right now, right? You know, that problem, that problem of efficiency is not being solved right now, right? So that is an extra delta, right? So we should acknowledge that. Uh, The second thought that, uh, you know, I want to share is that, uh, and and going back to what uh, Rajiv ji said earlier, uh, in the the comparison of, uh, you know, of the British Industrial Revolution, and let's say if we call this an Industrial Revolution right now, one was that I think at that point in time, technology was not, if I can use the word democratized, right? A few, you know, countries yeah. had access to technology, right? I'm not even today, I don't, I don't believe in a fairyland world to say that it is completely democratized, right? But I do believe that there is an opportunity, right? With, with technology such as AI and machine learning and so on and so forth right, that one could build a company in India that is actually, you know, a global, a, a global multinational corporation that is solving not just problems of India, but problems of the world, right? The next, the next Microsoft, the next Googles, right, they can be from here, right? Uh, they won't happen magically. They won't happen just because we wish them, 
The question is, what are we doing about it to ensure that such an environment gets created, right? Uh, how you know what can we do about it to ensure something like that happens? But I think that is that is an area where all of us, uh, you know, when I say all of us, whether it is civil society, whether it is policymakers, whether it is educators, industry, we need to see that because there is that opportunity right now, right? Let let's remember, right? Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley because of the work that happened in the 1950s and 60s, right? Uh, you know, with the entire semiconductor, uh, you know, uh, industry being there and talent being available, right? That's how the entire technology revolution happened there, right? Access to talent that was the biggest, and that continues to be the biggest driver for Silicon Valley companies, right? Uh, with AI, we all acknowledge that you know that the brain power is here. What do we do to ensure that you know the right entrepreneurial ambitions, ecosystems get created, and the fact that they stay here and do work and create companies? That could be that could be a game changer. Uh, the third part um, that I wanted to—I mean, this is slightly contrary to this discussion, so apologies for that. Uh, but my view, my personal view here is that you know. He, in this discussion, 2030 is a is a rhetoric point in time, right? Uh, what is I, I think most important is that are we set up to use this wave that is there to to traverse a different trajectory from what we are currently set to do, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll get there by 2030. Maybe we'll get there by 2035. Who knows, right? But you know this. We all have, I'm sure we all have heard this, right? It's about, it's about what in engineering, what is known as systems thinking, right? How do you build better systems, right? To be not marginally better, but, you know, drastically better than where you are today. From a competitive perspective, which Hari just, you know, beautifully brought up is that now we are seamlessly moving on to the next question. Where are we competitively, right? Where are we competitive? What I mean is, in the AI context, we uh, are we. How does how does India compare with you say USA or China? I am very happy that you guys are raising these issues. I mean, you are. Uh, I've by the way done uh, similar discussions with top uh, thinkers. I wanted to see what some of the younger people uh, who have more open thinking, who don't have a vested sort of stake in something and not going to get defensive about it, who can think out of the box. So I'm very glad to get all this. Now I'll give you a few of my thoughts. One of my thoughts is that um, India needs uh, an AI initiative on the same scale as ISRO and Baba Atomic Research Center. Uh, soon after independence, when India was a poor country, did not have food even. It was the genius of Homi Baba that we ought to be in this and we ought to be indigenous and we are, we are in indigenous development. For short term, we buy a reactor from here and there, but we'll simultaneously be introducing one of my uncles when I was a teenager was in the Atomic Energy Commission. So he used to we used to go to Thane, we used to visit all those places, very inspiring. So he used to say that the vision is that we should be able to do this is before the sanctions, before the uh, foreign people came and said that we won't we'll have a blockade on India for nuclear. You know, uh, this is long before that. Homi Baba wanted fully indigenous, state of the art thing. That's one great example where Indian brains did well. And the second example is Satish Dhawan, whom I also knew when I was a teenager. He was my father's classmate in Lahore. Uh, and so we were family friends. My father would take me there every time we visited Delhi to get some inspiration. So Satish Dhawan for ISRO built this huge vision, this thing, you know, that will be second to none. So I am of the opinion that India needs to create. If they, When they ask me, all these guys I interviewed, when they asked me, what do you want? I said, what I want is that I want uh, a, an AI government enterprise, huge scale, that is going to plot the whole plan, the strategy. China did something of that size about 15, 20 years ago. That's a good role model. China went and said, okay, it, looking at all the regions and provinces, it's going to be different. Looking at all the industries, it's going to be different. They figured out how many, how much, what technologies they need to beg, borrow, steal, and they stole some of the technology. Whatever they did, they had a plan. They had a master plan. So uh, India needs this kind of a master plan thinking. I think Niti Ayo is too tiny, too little, too too late, and they don't have the experts. You know, they have some economists. They have some some brilliant people in AI also, but not enough. You know, so that is one thought. I have a big thought. Second big thought I have is that. AI should be also, we should educate the NGOs. I think Rakesh mentioned that. It should not be just corporate thinking and people who are AI techie guys, you know. It should also be the, the people who are looking at society. 
uh, the society people are all doing destructive things. They are all fighting each other, for this community, that community, this jati caste. That's all nonsense. They should get rid of that and they should take on this project. They should take on the project. NGOs should say, okay, I'm going to take on the project of the future of India in the light of these kind of these challenges and opportunities. So I don't see that happening. I see, I, I, I see, I, I don't see social scientists. And I'm writing this book to get those guys woken up. And it's amazing. I've done similar things with prominent social scientists in prominent universities like Delhi. And they know nothing about it. And, and I'm talking about how it's affecting society. Do you know I invited some economists who are well known in the public space? They're always there, they're making talks and whatever not. They're very popular guys, <laughs> prominent economists. And their positions on AI, like ch children, you know, they don't know anything. One guy, one guy, uh, he said, I'll listen to you, I'll introduce you because you are my old classmate from college. That is why you talk to me about AI. Not because, and he's an economist. He's a he's an Oxford economist. Got a top job in India, huh? Yeah, in economics, in the current government. And he said, "Be Matho, I don't know. I am not into these things. I am an economist." Arey bhaiya, I told him, it's like suppose the industrial revolution was going on in Britain, which changed the whole world economy. And imagine at that time, some economist said, "Kabi, I don't care about the industry and all that. I am an economist." What a joke! So I am trying to shake up these kind of things. That's the kind of people I want to shake up. And so I need help from people like you because you understand. I can talk to you in a way whether we agree, whether we disagree. The point is we can talk to each other. We understand each other. And I need people from your kind. The book is dedicated to the scientists and technocrats. It is dedicated to people like this. The book is dedicated to scientists and technocrats. So it is a very, but I'm saying they are the ones who can learn social issues better than the social wallahs can learn these AI issues. They don't, don't seem to care even. They don't, maybe when the, when the technocrats, I'm a technocrat too, start dabbling in social issues and political issues, then those guys will react. First, they'll get angry saying, who are you? Why are you in our turf? But then they'll be forced to learn. And maybe that's what we have to do. So my role is to instigate, like, you know, the vaccination goes and instigate a reaction. You put in a little bit of the virus or something equivalent to the virus, and then the body immune system reacts. So I'm doing that kind of a job to get a reaction from our countrymen so that a large number of people will get up and start doing things. Government has to create something like ISRO. Uh, every state should have uh, a planning going on for the foreseeable future in light of AI. Every state, uh, chief minister should be doing it and every industry association should be doing it. The farmers group should be doing it, the car people, the whatever, every hotel people, everybody, every industry and every state should be doing these studies. It should not be just the job of some McKinsey guy. You know, uh, some Haryana people, why can't they uh, do a study, uh, get figure out what uh, what is going on? And this is the kind of instigation that I'm trying to do uh, uh, with this uh, with this uh, book. That I just wanted to uh, set that straight. I, I, I'm for technology. I accept that technology is inevitable. We cannot stop it or fight it. It has to happen. I also accept that India has a lot of potential because Indians are smart people and they can be trained to do all these things. But I feel that the broader issues have not been addressed. We better stay ahead of the curve. We better stay ahead of the problem rather than reacting after the problem blows up. And the problem could blow up. That is my fear right now. So back to you, Rakesh. So oh, thank you, sir. I mean, I think the the, the it, it is the, the way. Uh, I mean, the, the, this kind of playing the devil's advocate is, is an excellent way to kind of stimulate the thought, right? So you know, Hari had mentioned. You know, see, we we in the past we never had this type of uh, uh, thinking of you know uh, radical thinking. Why can't we create a, a, a powerful company like a Google or a, a Facebook or uh, that kind of you know real powerful company, right? or uh, any any company which can really transform like apple for example right we don't have that kind of thing so ai is now you know uh, you can build an ai system end to end with uh, everything open source right so uh, uh, if you have the education provided to uh, uh, a basic uh, a person from a small town and there are millions like that there are billions a huge number of people in, in small towns who who can get that education Right, and uh, you know, the, the, you know, this is an opportunity for entrepreneurs, 
who in the social economic uh, space socio economic space i still feel capitalism is the best way to innovate right i mean the whole capitalist thinking in terms of uh, st- thinking about how to innovate what to innovate how do we prof- how do we make ourselves profitable the company's profitable etc is still probably the best mechanism to channel human uh, talent and things like that right but having said that uh, rampant capitalism is i think a problem right the way capitalism is progressing at this point in time where you have very clear economic incentives in terms of share price and profits and things like that it's very difficult for an institution like a tifr and i completely agree with that an institution like a tifr like an isro is absolutely required when you are starting to think about such disruptive technologies disruptive areas of work like ai but having said that we need to have different types of institutions and not just focus on those profit minded capitalist institutions alone right yes organization will continue to act in a way because incentives are are organized that way so you need to also figure out what incentives you can give to organization so that they start thinking about whatever distribution of wealth doing it for society and things like that corporate social responsibility is one aspect of it but it's a very very small part right and not in line with how the world is changing but having said that can you create other types of institutions with other incentives right and isro if you look at isro what isro has accomplished over this period of time it's just amazing right for a country like india which had so many problems i think there's a very clear focus in terms of space is important for us to focus on right and then we are one of the world leaders in space technology right possible but i don't think you can focus on saying okay did isro bring a profit uh, at that point in time probably not right that was that was instituted with a purpose with a very clear mandate to say it is important for for us and for humanity as a whole right so i think that overall across the world not only in india i think it has to be capitalism has to become more responsible right that is one of the important thing especially in the context of ai where more wealth is going to get generated it it needs to have more responsible capitalism in place and at the same time we need to create other types of institution that's focused with a with a more perf- per, uh, purpose related thing rather than just the profit and shareholder value i also completely concur with uh, uh, what uh, rajiv ji mentioned earlier about uh, uh, you know uh, an organizational focus creating a new organization having their organizational focus uh, i think makes it on a sense uh, but you know my op- but i i i come from a school of thought where i feel that that won't be enough i think india's problems will be solved or have to be solved by india's entrepreneurs right uh, and i'm talking about problems such as agriculture problems such as healthcare problems such as education right the systemic problems right because you know if we keep waiting as a society that policies will get built and you know frameworks will happen it may happen uh, but we don't know there's no evidence of it happening till date at least right i think i think we have to kind of you know build companies for for solving these problems and uh, this generation our generation and the coming generation actually has that opportunity to be more entrepreneurial right our parents did not have that luxury right but i think our generation and our our, our children's generation have that opportunity to be more entrepreneurial and and i think it is you know i'm i'm very optimistic that we will see problems in whether it is supply chain whether it is um, education whether it is healthcare whether it is farming right i am very optimistic that actually we will see entrepreneurial solutions happening we may make mistakes there will be some companies that will do more harm than good right sir. but there will be some companies that that will do really well and actually take this forward the systemic thinking that you want and the jugaad are not necessarily consistent because jugaad is micro optimization me mind now or how to get out of my predicament i used to praise jugaad until i went to mumbai my uh, relative of mine very senior guy in tatas you know uh, says i'll tell you i'll show you jugaad rajiv bhai so he opened the electric panel and the wires were all jumbled here there there, there. he says this is a jugaad because when he brought this electrician to do something he did not have a view of how it will look for the next electrician he is not thinking of the big picture and this is a fire hazard is this is a fire hazard and you know this is jugaad this is the result of jugaad so now i i i am a little balanced about jugaad i think jugaad equals micro optimization rather than macro optimization 
and there is a re, there is a role for jugad as a kind of extreme uh, entrepreneurship uh, but there's also a role for macro optimization to put structures to put large scale infrastructure if you look at china in a communist country this capitalist entrepreneurship but there is an overall framing of what is for the national good there is an overall understanding of what is very large scale infrastructure that will not be profitable that is a 15 year project so it is like the equivalent of our isro and our baba atomic research the china has got a whole lot of this supply chain manufacturing ai kind of big projects big uh, ventures and china has made some billion dollar bets on very futuristic things long before anybody else did they bet they bet on this ai long ago you know they bet on solar power they bet on nanotechnology they bet on quantum computing now quantum computing china is neck to neck with the united states the united states is worried that if they build a quantum computer in china they'll be able to break all the security codes of all the conventional you know networks that exist today quantum computing will be able to beat all your password and whatever security you have it will be able to beat it and the only way to uh, resist uh, prevent a quantum uh, computer from breaking is if your network is also based on quantum computing then you can match it so india is nowhere nowhere in that i mean i have a i know somebody who to, was just hired by tifr to bring to start a quantum computing thought process in india it came from a degree in oxford or in cambridge so india is lagging behind in things which are big scale which take decades to do or lots of years to do require huge amount of money that is the scale of thinking that is needed which jugad people cannot do you know also uh, so so I, i so i think while jugad is needed but it needs to be run on a platform which is big thinking now how did this happen in the us i will tell you one thing you guys haven't mentioned is the uh, in the us there is the military industrial academic complex military industrial academic complex the three working together in india they working separately drdo got nothing to do with the uh, the academic you know you're a university student and your professor is not getting defense grants and all that when i was a graduate student in the united states uh, you know early 20s my professor was uh, said to me we got to get you a defense clearance you got to go to the pentagon with me we are going to have these meetings and i was very excited because my professor and this is quite normal in the tech in the stem industry stem disciplines that you have a professor in graduate school you're working with him he gives you some grant or some internship or some research fellowship and then you are part of some kind of a defense contract uh, and then there is a lot of academic industry alliance so many people had were working as students while as students they were working for grant that would came from this big company that big company and so when they graduated they always got a job there and the, it's good for the company to nurture young people nurture young people who are uh, you know aligned with your required research requirements so in india the academic world in higher education is not connected with the government military research or with the private sector research the research budget of india is like 0.8% of gdp china's is 2% of a much higher gdp so you can imagine the research we are not investing in i would say that the an action item would be to not have separate silos of military uh, industry and academic research but have a, a hyphenated united states did this and china is doing this also in china the military which is people's liberation army is highly connected with the academic world and highly connected with the industry so they are all very connected there uh, now china has got a different system a communist system doing this uh, collaboration between military industry and uh, academics the united states has got a democratic system but they're still doing it india has not done it india the these are three separate fragmented areas uh, which uh, which uh, need to be put together so that's a thought i have in any any example that uh, scenario that for example that can work out in india just 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 so so you know for instance i'll tell you us uh, the military like in the indian context let's say yeah, for example I'll, ad ad I'll, I'll, i'll give you the uh, uh, the us example will give you indian uh, thoughts the internet was a defense department it was called darpa net defense advanced research project agency and then it became arpa net for academic people i got i i was a user of internet before it was called internet then it was privatized and put out for the public to use called internet then uh, in uh, uh, when i was a vice president in itt the colleague 
with his office next to mine was a Chinese American guy who got the later he got the Nobel Prize for fiber optics. And it was a corporate uh, project uh, in our labs with the military. Night goggles was a corporate project that we had uh, with the military for military use. Speech recognition, the F-16 pilots wanted hands free. So instead of using their hands, they wanted to be able to speak the commands. So we did so much research on speech recognition. These are fundamental properties. Now, DARPA started this uh, driverless car, uh, closer to AI now. They started a competition saying they'll give a prize for the first uh, successful car that can go this across the desert in uh, California, you know, this uh, um, uh, the desert. So uh, Indian, Indian peop- uh, you know, government and military could create uh, challenges, could create competitions, could create funding uh, for the private sector. Uh, you know, the military industrial complex in US is giant companies like McDonnell, Douglas, Boeing's military division is huge. Microsoft got a military division, I mean, defense division. IBM got a defense division. So why don't they, Why don't the Indian military with all the government budget they have, outsource some of the R&D to the industry and to the uh, to the academics and create these uh, coalitions where the very big thinking, the big billion dollar bets can be placed like that. And then the jugar can happen. A lot of small guys can do that. I would I would like to see that happen. So just a point there. I, th- I, th- I think the defense and industry collaboration has just started. Uh, if I, I mean, I don't know how much of that is research versus just kind of, you know, manufacturing. Uh, but it's just started. We're just seeing, you know, reliances of the world getting into uh, getting into that space. Uh, but your point is well taken. I, I don't think I don't think Jugard is a replacement for systems thinking. Yes. Right. I think there is a space for both, uh, but you need both. Yeah. So the the basic problem is that in the West, it's defense that drives uh, technology research. In, in India, you know, after something has been uh, created. And, and the uh, general uh, corporate segment has absorbed that technology. And, and after that, probably the rest of the government departments have started looking at that technology is when the defense uh, starts looking at that technology. So, so uh, as, as such, in, in forget R&D, even in the absorption of a technology that has to be you know, probably bought from the market, uh, the defense uh, is, is, is generally moves pretty slow and and until this, there is a major industry and defense collaboration this 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 kind of research cannot be done by defense through in house resources it, it just cannot be done you're not structured like that to, to do that kind of research i can tell you in the us and in china because i to, for this research i studied china for the last 20 years what they've been doing cia has got a lot of their uh, uh, documents from Mandarin translated to English, and there are ways to get hold of them. So I studied a lot of that, and so their partnership and also the United States partnership is 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 a kind of defense funds research, and uh, they will get prototypes built by industry. Uh, then they may give this to successfully to, or to bid for manufacturing uh, to different people. They bring in academic people. Uh, they and they have so many grants available that you know if you are a graduate student doing some PhD in something, your professor, like your topic, he'll apply for a research grant from your industry, from government, military. And if it's a cutting edge topic, there'll be a lot of people putting money into it. And so, you know, as you're, as a student, you're also not only getting money and getting encouraged and inspired, but you're also being channeled because they're evaluating you. They're, they're coming, making sure you're putting your reports in and they're, they're checking that you're doing something useful. And then you are you are in colleague you have colleagues who are also young people doing similar things. So I think that ecosystem, that ecosystem India needs to create uh, to channel. So why why let so many brilliant people go run away overseas? <laughs> you know, uh, or, or they're working for American multinationals like some of you are working in India for the American multinational or Chinese now not nowadays not so many Chinese. But uh, instead of the brilliant brains going and creating intellectual property for others. If you created this kind of mechanism I'm talking about, then these guys would be part of the make, make in India for India intellectual property. And you need to do that because India cannot just go on be uh, importing foreign technology and implementing. Right now, Geo is very proud that we are the largest or second largest or third largest in the world in this, that, that. But it's all foreign technology. I mean, we may have all these uh, phones, but they, we bought them from somewhere. The Android is from somewhere like that. We got Facebook to doing our uh, WhatsApp. and <laughs> So it's a basically, 
basically the indian tycoon and billionaire i criticize them in this book they basically brought in uh, the westerner westerners and put themselves as the second tier the westerners are the top tier in the pyramid the second tier is the indian billionaire and he delivers a license from the indian government how to manage india how to deal with the indian culture he brings in all that value added and he makes money so uh, the i have uh, what i would have liked is if geo had said you know like jack ma that we'll take on and we'll build our google and we'll build our facebook and 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 so on now kudos to flipkart they did build the india's amazon and amazon price when google when geo when uh, flipkart uh, you know uh, was becoming very big and all that amazon's price in the united us stock exchange went down i remember a discussion uh, 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 in the in the us that now there is a one place in the world where they have been beaten and so maybe that can globalize i felt so good that now uh, flipkart will become international and they were, uh, amazon was scared of that amazon in fact tried to buy them out but they sold it to walmart so indians have reached a point where our thinking is not big enough uh, you know i was talking to a very major one of the big uh, investment bankers in bombay and he says most of the funding for this kind of technology comes from foreign venture capitals not indian 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 not investing in this they will invest in some building a building ho gaya <laughs> it's like old security ke land hai land le liya uh, but something like ai and all rolling the dice of several crores on it is very difficult for lot of indians to do you see uh, the thinking is so there is uh, the in this book i'm trying to shake up all that i'm trying to get the indian billionaires shaken up the why aren't you investing in the technology of the future rather than importing the technology that whenever somebody gives you a technology from a foreign country and that is generation n you can be sure that he's working on n plus 1 and plus 2 so you'll always be lagging behind and you you organize a army of a million uh, you know t- tech workers and basically market them as wage arbitrage uh, you'll you'll rent them at uh, you'll uh, hire them at $10000 a year let's say and you'll hire, rent them out at 30000 and make a lot of money but that's not indian technology that's indian brains so i'm actually feeling sorry for the indian brains that have not been utilized enough for their own good and for the good of the country that is my that is my closing statement if i may thank you so much i think uh, the, what you mentioned also about uh, this defense uh, industry uh, partnership it calls for a huge uh, i mean massive system, systemic change uh, yes I mean, it, it, and it, that that's that's a huge clarion call i, I would say in any, any closing comments from uh, anyone karthik uh, uh, anything from your end uh, we've had an awesome discussion thanks everyone i mean for your beautiful input yeah karthik over to you yeah Uh, no, I, I mean, I love the discussion. There are a lot of different perspectives, which I can go back and actually do a lot more research, right? At least, uh, and the avenue that I have in terms of also educating a few people again through great learning uh, kind of forums is I do teach a lot of people about AI. Now I'm going to definitely include a portion of some of these thought process around these battlegrounds also, right? We talk about, I mean, the max we get to is ethics and fairness and explainability, which is still more. more algorithm focused i think we'll have to move out and start talking about economy talking about impact on the economy and things like that so that's my take away in the whole thing of how do i incorporate it in my thought process and also in terms of disseminating this information to others overall from the perspective of what we need to do i think i i go back to my point about i think there are a lot of positive things that can happen but it needs a courage it needs a conviction it needs that different priorities to be managed appropriately for good things to come out of this whole thing right and i'm happy that uh, i mean i can be a participant in it at least when it pans out over the next 20 whatever 10 15 20 years if you are in that space where you can actually make an impact like the xerox ceo uh, when they were talking about global i uh, uh, sorry the uh, whole climate change and things like that they said xerox actually contributes to it right because there are papers and things like that but because you are in that position you have you can make the biggest contribution to it right of reducing um, or of having a, a bigger impact on all this climate change and things like that so things like so being a ai practitioner i feel there's a lot of responsibility there's also very interesting dynamics 
but it's very important to see all sides of the equation before kind of moving forward. So that's my takeaway. And thank you very much, you. Rajiv ji, and for everyone, Siddharth, uh, Hari, and Rakesh. Uh, for thanks, all, uh, thanks, uh, Karthik. Thanks, Siddharth. Thanks, Hari. And of course, Rajiv ji has ignited minds. Uh, uh, all of us. We've gone way beyond the time limit because, we, and we don't realize that. Actually, I, I can go for. I keep on talking for another hour because. This topic is, is 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 absolutely you know holding me gripping me, and I'm sure looking at the body language of the other panelists, they they can go on as well. But uh, you know I've been prompted that there is a time limit over here, so uh, thank you everyone um, for your uh, wonderful participation and uh, Rajiv ji for igniting our minds. It's 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 been it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I, for I, I want to also thank all of you. I want to thank uh, you know, Rakesh, Karthik, uh, Hari, Siddharth. Each one of you has brought good provocations. See, I'm a provo provocative guy. That's why I left all the organized kind of to go and provoke, provoke, provoke. I have nothing to lose. I'm 70 plus. I don't need a job. I, they can't hire me. They can't fire me. So I want nothing from them. What I what I really need for myself for the rest of my life, others can't give me. That is up to my own quest. And what others can give me is of little value. So I can be free. I can I I earned my freedom because I worked very hard when I was a young guy. I started with nothing, so I am actually with similar background to a lot of you guys. I'm a technocrat, and I'll just tell you one little thing. Uh, Mr. Kohli died, who was the head, who was a big pioneer of TCS, Tata Consultancy. Cool, yeah. I was the first project leader in the United States for the first successful large-scale outsourcing software in the United States. Uh, and, and one day I can tell you the whole story. But uh, I was appointed project leader. TCS sent, uh, they sent a whole lot of people. They were a very tiny, $200 billion company, 200, 300 billion, not even a billion. And they sent a few programmers. And this pro uh, uh, job was considered so difficult, nobody was doing it. So I thought, you know, if we get Indian programmers, we can put a lot of them and we'll do it. And we were very successful. And this became a flagship. Then the chairman of our company in the U.S. wanted to keep hiring TCS people. And then we did one project after another. So I got to know uh, Kohli quite well. And so about seven, eight years ago, uh, I was launching, I was the chief guest launching a book on the DVD on the history of yoga in Mumbai. And there was Kohli ji sitting there. And so he, he remembered when I, when I reminded him because, of course, I was a very junior fellow, you know, compared to him. But I, I am so impressed that we have towering figures like that. We have towering figures like that, uh, Kohli. We need somebody for AI. We need the Satish Dhawan, the Homi Baba, the Kohli for AI today. And, and uh, that's the hope I have that this book will inspire uh, different people to come together and think big. And so thank you, all of you. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we, we should continue this conversation because I'm going to, throughout 2021, this is my campaign. My campaign is AI and society. Good things, bad things, what we should do, provoke more people, get more people into the conversation, go to districts, go to states, go to NGOs, uh, go to gurus. I want to go to gurus also. They don't understand the social. I mean, we haven't talked about the spiritual dimension, but there's a whole chapter on the spiritual aspects of this also. <laughs> and gurus are not educated in this. They have to get into this. So thank you very much uh, for organizing. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.